oh, it's all about the hops and horror. And I love how cheesy that was. During Monster Palooza 2019, I was sifting through the Trick or Treat Studio selection of horror themed air fresheners, hoping my husband would finally buy that fucking Krampus mask that he's been looking at. The intimidating looking gent that was patient enough to chat with my husband was none other than Bo Cooper. I didn't know that at the time. I instantly did know that Bo's total metalhead stature was like that of most metalheads. Kind and welcoming. So after a time, I got to follow Bo and chat with him throughout the 2019 Halloween season. Bo is kind, he's well receptive, and he's welcoming. Former pro wrestler he is, a hubby, and now a fantastic horror movie review host for the new Hops and Horror page. Bo is awesome. Beer and horror films, boils and ghouls. Beer and horror films. Do I need to say anything else? You've seen him manning the Trick or Treat Studios booth at all of our favorite horror conventions. You've seen him at the biggest horror events with his goddess. And you've seen him throw down in the ring. So boils and ghouls, I give you Bo Cooper. Shut the fuck up. Bo, hey, what's up, Michelle? So Thanks for having me. Hey, of course. Thank you for showing up to my show. Like... I feel again. I'm a bit starstruck. Even every time I see you, I'm like, "Hi!" So thank you for coming no. on today. <laughs> I appreciate you very much. That was a great intro, by the way. I, I mean, you're talking. I mean, I'm just some humble guy. I mean, you're building me up like I'm some sort of star or something. But I appreciate you very much, and I love your ambience in the background. It's uh, getting into the Halloween season, and it's getting me more pumped up. So that's awesome. Fuck yes, because we are Halloween. I love your background from what I was able to gather. So, of hey. course, the first thing about me as I drink my Sunday beer, I have hey, to know... Sunday, you gotta, you gotta drink some IPAs, right? Right? And all these came from the Witches Brew, Black Plague Brewing Company, so I figure it's more, you know, it goes with along with what we'll talk about later on is hops and horror. <laughs> of course, yeah. And I'm a little buzzed already, sorry, because I didn't eat much. It's all good. <laughs> that's, so the only reason I'm not, do... that's the only reason I'm not having a beer right now, is I haven't eaten anything all day, because I went grocery shopping, and I just, I knew I had to get back and do the interview with you, so I... Once I get a couple uh, bites to eat, you know, I'll, I'll definitely throw back a couple cans today. Hell yeah, because why not? We have a long week to get through. And then on top of that, it is the Halloween season. It's Halloween all year long, but it really is like when we go crazy. I love when that saying comes out. Absolutely. Um, you know, one thing that that is a part of who I am is I love getting to know people. And I need to know what your background story is because everybody has a story. So... Mm -hmm. You know, what I would like to know about you, Bo Cooper, that you haven't told everyone that or put it out there is where did you grow up and what is your earliest Halloween memory? So as a young toddler, uh, when I was super, super young, I grew up probably from the age of like one to like six, uh, maybe seven uh, Pacific Palisades. My mom had a house out there with, uh, with my grandma. We lived out there. And then we moved from Pacific Palisades to the San Fernando Valley. And from the age of like maybe, I don't know, eight or nine, I lived in San Fernando Valley to maybe like age 12. And then we moved to Simi Valley, uh, where I currently live now, um, Simi Valley, California. Um, so I went to junior high out here. I went to Ellen Ball. Yeah, I went to junior high out here. And then I went to uh, continuation high school out here in Simi Valley. Um, and that's where I can currently live now. Me and my wife bought a, our second home uh we had our first home uh, that we purchased in 2015 and we just felt the time was right to upgrade to a bigger house so the market was good and it was crazy during a pandemic to buy a house but we said hey screw it let's let's try to get some because the interest rates were so low so we said you know it's a good time to do it so we bought our second house um and sold our first home and now we're still living here in Sioux Valley. and then uh if you want to talk about my earliest earliest halloween memory i mean honestly i mean ever since i was a baby i remember my uncle Tony coming over and carving pumpkins with me and taking us trick or treating and, and, you know, just the ambience of the nighttime and seeing all the pumpkins lit and the, eating the candy. Um, so, I mean, I, ever since I was a little kid, I always enjoyed, you know, going trick or treating. I mean, it was just my favorite time of year. And then, you know, once I got a little bit older, I started not really uh, following my parents uh, rules of not watching horror or watching horror. So I said, Hey, I'm going to start watching horror movies. And that got me even more involved in horror and Halloween. So ever since I was probably about, Five years old, my earliest memories. 
I love it. I love it. So you noticed that Halloween and Children of the Corn were your earliest, were the earliest horror films that you ever saw. Now, what is it about Halloween especially that drew you into, I mean, you're wearing a Michael Myers shirt right now. Um, right. I think I know where that shirt came from too. What is it about Michael Myers that drew you in? Well, I mean, as a really young kid, I didn't understand it, obviously, except seeing a really scary guy in a mask. I mean, I didn't really enjoy um, the backstory until I got a little bit older. But I remember seeing him on TV uh, probably when I was about nine years old, um, and it just definitely freaked me out. I mean, it's just a blank, pale, you know, face coming across your TV screen. And I remember, I remember that specifically. I remember uh, the scene when he you know, stuck Bob on the wall and tilted his head. And I thought that was the most creepiest thing I ever saw. So it definitely gave me, you know, a little bit of nightmares uh, then. Um, as far as Children of the Corn goes, that was the first movie that I actually witnessed that I wasn't supposed to because it came on on HBO. And I remember it was like probably like late at night. I was just laying on the couch and they came on and I started watching it. I don't know where my mom was and she didn't care. And I started watching that. And then when the kid got, you know, hit by the car, and it just and he sat up straight and his neck was slit. And I mean, it just definitely freaked me out for a, quite some time. But then I wanted to get, you know, more intrigued and find out why is this scaring me? You know, I wanted to see more of it, even though it's like kind of like a car crash. You don't want to look, but you do look, you know. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Um, <laughs> I laugh because actually I'm going to pause for just a second. Chuck, okay. just so you know, because you probably have to know the time of this disruption. I'm getting a lot of feedback in my microphones. It sounds like something's possessing my ear pods every time I talk. And it's kind of rad, but I just want to make sure you're not hearing it. I don't hear it. Do you hear it? Okay, you don't hear it, Bo. Chuck, do you hear it? Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm good. Can you hear us? Yeah, he can hear. Okay, cool. All right, so I'll continue. I think it's funny, you know, too, when, you know, I hear this a lot, you know, it's a, it's pretty much unanimous around us horror fans that a lot of us were told either you can watch the horror film or you can not watch it and then we do it anyways. And then we want to find out as children what scares us. And right. I think that's really important. And I think that ties into a lot about, you know, us black sheep and a lot of us questioners where we're like, this is why we love horror movies because we want to know why we're afraid. And I'm just saying if more people were like the horror community who loved horror movies, if you question what is why this scares you so much, maybe you'll understand a lot of things about your own life. <laughs> right. Just um, a little TED talk from Michelle Halloween there. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I, 100%. I mean, what was the first movie that you ever watched that scared the hell out of you? Oh, interview time. Um, what The first one that actually scared the fucking living shit out of me was The Exorcist. And yeah. that was because well, I was already... Me, I mean. It still scares me. And I think it was because how it was hyped up. Um, my, you know, I was already watching like Nightmare on Elm Street. The first movie I remember watch horror movie I ever watched was The Gate. And I was about... I think I want to say I was about five or six years old and I was in San Fernando Valley and with some family and we, they were watching the gate. And I remember those creepy ass little claymation creatures terrifying the shit out of me. So the then gate, I went home yeah. and started, yeah, watching Nightmare on Elm Street. And then my dad, I was 11 and we were at a birthday party and my dad was like, I was talking shit because I was bored. I didn't want to be there. And I'm like, dad, I'm a horror movie fanatic. I know what I'm doing. Nothing could scare me. And he's like, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I Watch got one this. for you. Yeah. yeah. So needless to say, it scared the fucking shit out of me. I was, um, I still, I've tried to do, I, I refuse to like look into it as a kid, why it scared me so much until I got older because I tried watching it again when it was re-released in the theaters in the year 2000. Still mm. scared the fucking shit out of me. I can yeah, watch it I these mean, days, but. It's definitely one of those movies you know, that just doesn't settle well with me either. I mean, my wife hardly loves it more than anything. I, I appreciate it. I think it's a great cinematic, you know, film. I mean, it, uh, Exorcist, when you talk about that film, I mean, it definitely, it ruined my childhood because I, I remember when I was probably like 12, I, I didn't know what it was. I started watching it on, uh, I think it was on pay-per-view. I clicked just to click it and I bought it and then you know, I started watching it and it literally put me in like nightmares. I, mean, I, I still to this day don't like watching it alone. I mean, it, it has a lot of powerful elements. I mean, you're talking about the most demonic movie of all time, in my opinion. I mean, right? Did you look? 
have not yet read the book. I, I definitely plan to at some point in my lifetime before I croak, but I definitely want to read that because I, I know it um, it has some different tones to it. They say like, it, well, anything you're reading is more psychological. You know, if you're reading a book rather than seeing it, you have to make up your own images in your head. So it can be more scarier if you make it that way. But um, yeah, I do I definitely. Find, yeah, honestly, <laughs> I didn't find the book to be that as horrifying as the film. Um, oh, really? what, what book that, and I, I could blame it on, well, I saw the movie first, but I don't think so because, you know, I saw Pet Cemetery as a kid and, you know, it's one of my favorite, uh, films because it's actually fucking scary. Right. Um, but then when I read the book after I read the book years after I actually saw the movie and the book is fucking terrifying. It's scarier Pet than Cemetery? the film. Yeah. The original, not this bullshit remake, but no, the one no. that they just, oh, well, uh, the original. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you, the there's two, there's two things that actually scare me to this day that I will not watch at nighttime, even though I'm a big old fat dude, 300 pound, you know, crazy motherfucker. But The Exorcist, Regan, you know, I mean, and Zelda from Pet Cemetery. Right? I mean, that's... Like, Zelda was, but like, just thinking about Zelda, I get the goosebumps. And it's yeah. worse, she's worse in the, in the book. Like, right. it's worse. So you get this other image of your head, you get Zelda in your head from the movie, and then you read the character, it's fucked. Like... Yeah. Well, we should we should do that one day. <laughs> like, let's be afraid. <laughs> I know, right? Seriously. <laughs> so let's get back to Bo. Um, you know, let's talk about Brawl and Bo. You were a fan of wrestling and mm -hmm. ended up wrestling for professionally for over 22 years. So what planted the wrestling seed in your life? Um, well, I had two loves and I still only have two loves. You know, uh, I love horror movies and I love well, I should say three because I love beer. Horror movies, beer, and pro wrestling. But when I was a you know minor, the two things that I grew up on was uh, horror movies and pro wrestling. I was a huge pro wrestling fan. Uh, I started watching you know WWF when I was probably I don't know eight years old. I, I tuned in and I first saw The Ultimate Warrior and I was hooked. And I used to have my mom and my family. We would go to the house shows at the LA Sports Arena, Long Beach, you know, arena, and we would always try to make any live events that when they came to town as possible. Um, I got a little bit older. I was about 12 years old and I remember going down to the LA sports arena and we got there early and there was all the wrestlers coming in from the back. And, you know, I was trying to get an autograph and all that. And I, I stopped and I said, Hey, this one wrestler walked by. I didn't know who he was, but he, I knew he was a wrestler because he was big and he had his gear bag with him. And I said, Hey, I want to be a, I want to be a wrestler just like you one day. And he stopped and he looked at me and he goes, well, if you're serious kid. And he looked at my mom, he goes, I'll give you a number to call when you're a little bit older. It's the wrestling school that I started out with. Um, so he gave me the number. Um, it was in San Bernardino. I called the number and they said, Hey, you're a little bit too young. Why don't you come back? Uh, why don't you come back when you're like 14? I said, okay, cool, whatever. And then I kept that number. And I remember going down to actually Vern Langdon's wrestling school, Slammer's gym. And, and I checked out Vern Langdon's wrestling school. Yeah. And a lot of people in the horror industry don't know that he was involved with pro wrestling for a long period of his I life. I knew that. Did That's you? crazy. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people don't, and it's crazy because, like, I mean, I wanted to join Slammers, but once again, they said, you're I'm young. Um, so I ended up just, you know, saying, okay, I'll put that on hold. I continue to watch wrestling and be a fan. I, I heard about a wrestling school called the School of Hard Knocks from um, a local – before podcasts and Zoom, there was, like, local cable access interview channels. Like, they would interview oh, – yeah. Like, yeah, wrestlers and stuff. This guy, Shadow, he had a, um, a wrestling podcast, I guess you would call it a podcast, cable access. And he mentioned the School of Hard Knocks. And I said, that sounds familiar. So I, I asked my mom to call that number and see if they would take me. And they said, yeah, come down and we'll see, you know, if you're able to be a pro wrestler. So I drove down there. I was intimidated. They had the wrestling ring set up. And uh, the two trainers that owned the school at the time were Jesse Hernandez and Bill Anderson. So I said, hey, do you recognize this uh, number? And they said, yeah, that, that was our old school's number that, you know, we had a new number. And I said, oh, well, one of the wrestlers gave it to me. And they said, well, I wonder which one. Well, that day I started training. Louis Spicoli came in to train, and he was the one that gave me that number. So I knew it was a weird sign. I mean, that's two years later. It was just really, really strange. So I kind of said, hey, this is meant to be. I, I paid the money to you know, start being a pro wrestler, and I started training at the age of 14, and I had my first pro match at 16. So it took me two years to actually, you know, learn. But I think my trainers wanted that because they didn't want me to go out there and, you know, get hurt as a kid. They wanted to make sure I was ready to not hurt someone else. And I, I was mature enough at the time to perform in front of a live audience. So my first match was uh, 
May 4th, 1996 at the San Bernardino uh, Boys and Girls Club. There was about 300 people there for their anniversary show. And I never stopped. You know, I just, I, I wanted to make a life career out of it. Um, I never made a lot of money in pro wrestling, but I got to live out a lot of dreams that I wanted to, you know, have accomplished. I got to wrestle a lot of legends, a lot of Hall of Famers, um, you know, working with guys like Jimmy Snuka, Honky Tonk Man, uh, Sabu, Gangrel. I mean, the list goes on, but it's kind of like music. You know, the best way I can describe pro wrestling for people that don't make a living out of it, even though they're striving and traveling all over and, you know, damaging their bodies for years and years, um, is kind of like music. You know, there's a thousand amazing artists out there that open up for, you know, bigger, bigger mm -hmm. music, uh, you know, events, uh, bands, but they, they get to live the rock style life. They just don't get that contract. And that's pretty much what happened with me, but it's okay. You know, my career has taken a turn for the better. I'm not breaking my body anymore because it's already broken, but <laughs> I get to, I get to talk about masks and costumes with the wonderful career uh, opportunity that I got from my now full-time job, trick or treat studio. So it kind of shifted from one dream to another. So. It's pretty bad, out, you know. Um, I remember seeing you. We were at Santa Monster Palooza last year, and you were there at the Trick or Treat Studio, the booth, and you were in an insurmountable amount of pain. But you were still so sweet and kind. Everybody who came up to the booth, and I'm like, "What's up, Bo?" And you're like, "I'm just hurting so bad." And uh, you know, it's just it standing. Yeah, it's my back. I mean, I, 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 I got told at the age of 21, I'm 40 now, uh, that I needed to probably get back surgery then, and I never did it just because L4, L5 discs are gone, um, just from damaging it you know, from you know, all the slams and the balls and the brutal chair shots and everything, you know. And, and when you're young and you got adrenaline going, you know, you feel the aches and pains afterwards, but you say, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm going to have a couple of beers and get, get on with my life and not worry about the pain so much. But now it's creeping up on me. I mean, when I stand for too long periods of time, it definitely takes a toll on me. But, you know, at least uh, I could sit down here and there and rest the back. And plus, you know, me being a bigger guy doesn't help, you know, so I've always tried to change my lifestyle a little bit. But I think I'm going to be big till the day I die. But hopefully, you uh, know what? <laughs> it's. You're beautiful the way you are. I'm sorry. You. I love, you, you know, I love when you look at wrestlers or you look at front line men and you look at, I'm always looking at men. And I say, in Michelle Halloween opinion, if you have a beard and you've got that bod, <laughs> you're perfect. That's well, just my you. opinion. But I love the well, bigger the man and the beard, you're perfect. And you're a fucking thank wrestler. You. You're always going to be a wrestler. So enjoy yeah, your I'll, life. I'll always yeah, I'll always be, you know, I, I mean, I'll always be involved somehow. I mean, I have my ring uh, that me and my partner purchased in like, uh, I think it was 2017, we purchased the ring. Um, I've taught, you know, before then I was teaching, you know, wrestling uh, at a couple schools. But, um, you know, once before the pandemic hit, I was actually looking for, you know, a venue to set up shop so that I could actually have a business and start my own wrestling school. Because I've taught a lot of guys out there in the Southern California scene and um, they've done well, but I feel like if I actually had a business and a venue set up, you know, you can make money off of pro wrestling as well. And that's something that I've lacked to do is make a good uh, amount of money off of pro wrestling because promoters don't pay shit. I mean, if you're right. breaking into business, even when you're a veteran, I mean, unless you've been on TV and you've had a major contract with one of the companies, you're not going to get rich off pro wrestling. So, uh, but yeah, once the pandemic ends and we go back to normal in this fucking crazy world, uh, hopefully I'll get the ring set back up and start rocking and rolling again. Cause like I said, I'm, I'm always going to be involved with pro wrestling somehow. I mean, I still keep in contact with a lot of people that are in the industry. I've just, I haven't wrestled in two years. Um, I still work the uh, Micromania shows, which is my buddy, Billy Blade. He's done tremendous. Um, he's done a tremendous job across the nation with the, the little guys, the little, little you know, you can't say the yeah, word, midget. Yeah. you can't say the word midget anymore. People get offended, but the, the Micromania tours are awesome. And, um, I've always was a fan of them and I did a lot of hosting with them. So once the world opens back up, I, I plan to be a part of that again. Holy shit. I didn't know that you did announcing for micro, but that's bad ass. I mean, it's yep. awesome. So yeah, it's yeah everyone's offended they just by got, everything. Yeah. They just got back uh micro mania tour just got back from Sturgis and I guess South Dakota Sturgis is completely opened up because there was thousands of bars and they did like four shows uh, in a week span. So it was pretty crazy to see that. You know? Are know. they okay? Everyone's okay. That's I, yeah. Yeah. From weeks. what I, I know it's, it's pretty gnarly. I didn't, I told him, I said, you better be careful, man. Cause that yeah. coronavirus ain't no joke. You know?
but it's been what, two weeks in Sturgis. I didn't know that they were still doing wrestling either. But thank you, Bo, for making sure at least you're putting in the seat, you know, telling people, please be careful if you're yeah, going to go out I there mean, and do it. I, I believe, yeah. I mean, I'd rather, <laughs> if the shit, I mean, I'd rather be safe than sorry. I mean, that's my opinion, you know. Well, we can't do anything for dead, you know. We right. can't live out our dreams. So exactly. you answered my question. You still plan to get back in there and start teaching. I see you with your own ring, gym, all that stuff, and you're going to be a mentor. So it's happening. There, yeah. it's in the world. <laughs> now, I have to bring up Roddy fucking Piper. Yeah. Oh, my God. That is one of my favorites. I know I say this a lot. Three top three favorite movies was They Live and that fight scene. I didn't know who Roddy Popper was until I saw They Live, you know, in the well, because I'm also 40. I think I saw They Live first in the 90s. And okay. I'm thinking this guy is so fucking badass. I didn't realize he was a wrestler until oh, yeah. I started watching wrestling in 1999. So, mm -hmm. fuck, what was he like? Did you meet uh, his ass? I got, the, I got the opportunity. Well, I didn't wrestle him one on one, I got the opportunity okay. to, to be on a show with him. Um, and actually two shows, I was on two shows with Roddy and the first show, you know, obviously I just said, Hey, hello, you know, I'm nice to meet you, sir. You're an honor. You know, it's an honor for you to be here. Uh, if you need anything, let, you know, let us know, we'll take care of you, you know? And then the second show I was on with him, uh, he kind of recognized me. He goes, Hey, I think I've seen you before. I said, yes, sir. I, you know, I've been around and he, he goes, well, how you doing? And I started talking to him and we actually just had like a 25 minute conversation, um, about his, you know, his, his, his history in the business and, and, and the advice he would give, you know, to the up and coming guys. And he was super cool, man. I mean, I, you know, some guys can be dicks, but Roddy was definitely, uh, one of the, the, the stars, uh, the legends, I should say that I got to be on a show with and be around. And he definitely, uh, had a great, great, great run in pro wrestling. I mean, he's one of the great, I, I say he is the greatest heel of all time. I mean, his, his interviews are legendary. His his work in the ring is is pretty phenomenal. And yeah, man, it's sad because when he passed away, it was pretty sad that uh, you know, for all of us. But the fact yeah. that I got to talk to him and get to know him on a personal level was something uh, something amazing. It's you yeah. know, and yeah. that's interesting that you bring up like when our heroes, you know, pass away, and we his death was um, also very unexpected. It's been what five years. <laughs> About, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's always so hard when you know people that we admire admire and look up to, and then especially when we have that moment with them. Um, what advice? Being as we we just you know us um, you know Black <clears throat> America just lost Chadwick Boseman just out boom nowhere nobody knew yeah, that was that was sad. nothing. It's horrifying. And here's Did they find out how he passed away because I haven't found. Yeah, I mean, I... um, colon cancer. He was actually. Um, during the filming of 42 and the last few films that he was doing, he was sick and he didn't tell anyone, nobody knew, nobody but his family knew and his doctors obviously that he has been fighting colon right. cancer for four years. And he's a little bit older than we are because I'm 40 as well. So yeah. when shit like that happens, I remember people telling, I remember when Bowie died, I remember 2016 when we lost every celebrity ever that we yeah. loved. Um, it's hard, you know, telling, people especially our younger the younger generation because we have stories now we have some wisdom right. behind it what advice can you give to those grieving those that we may not have met them you know and got to spend a half an hour with them but there's that connection that we have with our heroes what mm. advice do you give to those grieving over the ones that we lost like when we lost roddy it was horrible it was terrible right. um, well we've i've you know and i'm not trying to sound selfish but you know in pro wrestling wrestlers I mean, shit, man. I have like, I have a collection of figures. They're in storage, but I remember recently bringing them all out and like, you know, wiping them down because they're worth a lot of money. So I'm just trying to <laughs> maybe one day sell them. But uh, my point is, is that I, I line them all up and I probably have about like 60 of them and like half of them are gone. And, you know, pro wrestling, uh, they pro wrestlers, they definitely have, we've lost a lot of them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some have been closer to me than others, but advice i mean i would just say think about the great memories that you got the opportunity to sh you know watch them on tv and and the feelings that they gave you or your heroes that you, you know you look up to just try to think of the good memories that you know you have of them and don't let that memory die keep the keep, keep you know the dream alive i guess you would say of you know appreciating what they did for you in, in life you know because some some people go quicker than others and it's a, it's just the part of life and it sucks but what can you do except just Cherish the, cherish the thoughts and memories that you had with them and, and try to 
think about the good times and try to try to you know say a prayer for him. I mean, I'm not too too hugely into God, but I know that there is a God, in my opinion, and I feel that um, you know it, wh whoever you believe in, just try to think of a better place that they're in rather than this earth, because I know this is temporary. So, yeah. <laughs> Who but, wants to be here? Yeah, especially I do, I don't. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. I really like to ask, um, you know, and I, I haven't done this in many interviews, so you'll be the first one. Uh, let's just, before I get, I'm a, huh? You're I'm a personal, <laughs> yeah, I'm a personal. All right. But it's interesting to me how, how do people, okay, so, and I just thought this up, I'm, I'm going off my little script here, but let's talk about COVID. Holy shit, what, my, the things that I thought would do humans in, were, would be either climate change because obviously there's insurmountable evidence. That, I mean, we see it every day. It was 100 and like fucking 20 where I live. Uh, you live in Simi right. Valley. It gets hot as fuck out there. Yeah, it, um, it gets hotter every year. The water levels are rising. The glaciers are melting. I thought for sure we'd die by or we'd be done in by. And I don't say I'm not saying we're done in yet. But in my lifetime, I thought I'd see a meteor hit the planet or climate change before a fucking virus took right. over the world. You no, know, sure. so did you ever think about like doomsday? What would your opinion? What did you think it would be if you got I to mean, see it? I mean, I have this weird fucking thought I've always thought about. I mean, I don't. it probably sounds ridiculous, but I always just picture like just us as a earth balls floating in space, just dropping, like just falling. And then that's it. You know, I mean, I, I always tell people, like, my, I, I don't know, I was talking about that the other day. I was like telling my buddy, I was like, dude, do you ever just sit there and think about we're literally just a fucking ball in the middle of the world in space and it just floats and gravity and what if something just said, fuck, we're done and that's it. What if <laughs> and it you know, we just fall out of space. I mean, it sounds Holy obviously ridiculous because of gravity, but I mean, if you really think about it. it yeah, if we it move, if we, how lucky are we? If we move just a few what million miles in any direction we're fine right. because we need yeah. the sun we need it's just so ah! <laughs> i know you, you start tripping out and you go oh shit <laughs> yeah i gotta get high later and we're gonna have to discuss oh, those <laughs> god that sounds terrible <laughs> no Bad trip. actually i'm the one who's like let me trip let me get high and let's talk about the end of life itself few minutes oh break. stop it michelle dude that shit's crazy dude <laughs> <laughs> like, he's like, I'd rather, I'd rather drink beer and now. talk about horror movies and fucking talk about the. I try not to think about dying too much. Okay, okay, okay. You know what movie that you know what movie clip that's from? Wait a minute. No. I Go. Never think about dying. I try not to think about like, dying too much. I feel like I've heard. Okay, I've heard this a million Return times. Living Dead. Return of the Living Dead. When Leanna Quigley is sitting there in the graveyard. With uh, I, I forget the actor's name. He's the black guy that was in uh, Friday Thirteen Part Five. And he's on the shitter, and he's talking about it's a lot of. I forget the actor. He's been in a lot of horror movies, but she's sitting there asking him like, "Do you ever think about dying?" And he's like, "I try not to think about dying too much." And she's like, "Well, I just fantasize about it, and I love it." So it's like, go rewatch that. You'll enjoy. It. I gotta watch Return that tonight. Of, Return, um, of Return of the Living Dead. Return of the Living. Fucking Leanna Quigley, dude. <laughs> I think yeah, she's I know, as crazy right? as she is in real life in all her movies. Sure. You, you've met her. <laughs> yeah, she's a good a Write that down. Yeah. In your 40, now that you're 40, is your memory just like fucked? Because I have like short term memory like a motherfucker. I have to write um, everything down. No, memory is pretty good with me. Uh, you know, knock on wood. That's one thing that so far hasn't gone. Except <laughs> the degrading, but, um, my memory is so far good. I have a pretty crazy memory. I, I remember a lot of uh, details and. Yeah, so I mean, hopefully that stays because memory is a big one. Yeah, we need that. That's just I have to write everything down. Okay, okay. So we're talking about Roddy Piper. Sorry, I just got really excited because I'm thinking about your earth falling thing, and then my mind is just going off in a different tangent. Okay, so you just came off of a film shoot like two weeks ago. What is your experience with acting? You fucking act on top of everything else you do. Um, yeah, I've done a couple of things here and there. I, I think. Uh, my father, uh, Bobby Cooper, he's done a lot of roles. He's he's had a couple big parts. He's SAG after. Um, he's friends with a lot of the celebs and shit, so he gets roles. Not saying that he did, wouldn't get the roles, you know, as an actor, but he definitely gets you know help from a couple famous people like John Penn and Charlie Sheen, who get him in a couple iconic roles. But um, I, I was so busy with pro wrestling, I, I, I whatever came my way. Like I remember doing a movie called Backyard Dogs. It was wrestling oriented. That was my first. Um, time being on a movie set that was like in 2005 
five maybe or four. Uh, I don't. I'm terrible with dates. That that. So memory wise, I'm terrible with like when shit was of wrestling or like my dates. I don't know anything like that. Um, year wise, I guess you would say. But my first, yeah, my first time being on a set was uh, Backyard Dogs. Um, I did a couple documentaries that were pretty big time on like A and E Travel Channel. So that was kind of like getting into the TV uh, movie industry. Um, I did uh, a movie called The Dwelling. It was it only went to straight to like on demand at the time. Back that was like 2000. Shit, that was probably 2005 ish maybe. And then I did uh, what I do? I did Candy Corn. No, I'm sorry. I did uh, Charles Band's movie called Raven Wolf Towers. It was a series part like part three series i think like that you know that was on hulu and amazon uh that was my first time you know being um in a prosthetic makeup effect type you know monster role and got paid for it um behind you know obviously you get paid for your work but that was pretty cool you know working with charles band was awesome you know he's the man that created puppet master and all his amazing films that he does and uh getting the you know actually be put in makeup uh was pretty fun i i, I couldn't handle sitting there for seven hours a day like you know some guys like doug tate and you know guys that you know really are you know character actors they, they go through a lot because I, I was getting like annoyed when they were scrubbing my face off at the end of the day and then putting the pro a prosthetics on but at the you know at the end of the day it was awesome seeing myself as you know transform into an awesome monster so it was cool um plus you know like i said working with charles man was awesome i got the opportunity to, to be a little quick Three second part in Candy Corn, which was cool working with my boy Justin Avery, uh, Josh Hasty, you know, the amazing director he is. Um, being on set with, you know, Courtney Gaines, man, from Children of the Corn, which is such a, you know, iconic movie for me. Um, having, you know, him be there and talk about, you know, the movie and stuff and listening to his advice that he would give some of the actors was pretty awesome. And, you know, working with Poncho Moeller, he was amazing to work with. And, yeah, so that was fun. Um, and then I recently just did a little background scene, but the uh, director, I can't say too much about it, but the director, you know, gave me a good compliment. He goes, I can't believe, you know, you haven't done more. You have a great presence. I said, well, thanks, man. So he kind of, I was only supposed to be in the background with my buddy, uh, Big Schwag, Brett Wagner, because he was a biker bar fight scene. And, the, you know, from what I can tell, the director took a liking to me and kept wanting to position me in better, you know, uh, better areas so the camera could focus more on me. So that was awesome. That felt good. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to do acting more. Um, you know, obviously, if, it, if I haven't pursued it as much as I probably should have. Um, but I did tell my wife, I said, hey, you know, I really should start trying to do a little bit more with that because I know I'm a big guy. I have tattoos and there's a lot of, you know, roles that could be fulfilled with that look, you know, the big six foot three tattooed guy. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, we'll see where uh, the world takes us if it ever opens up again. Oh fuck yeah! I'm excited. Yeah, because I would love you know to what? As, I mean, I would love to do as much horror films as possible. But you know, actors can't be choosy, really. You know, whatever comes your way, you gotta accept it. But I don't have the pay. I, I didn't. I shouldn't say I don't. I do now because I'm a little bit older. I don't. I didn't have the patience to go to, you know, an audition, sit there and and really give my you know heart and soul on you know to read lines for someone and then have it get denied. I just was like, ah, oh, fuck that. If they're gonna accept me, they're gonna want me. And uh, like even with Charles Band, like. My buddy said, hey, I, I know um, he's looking for a big guy. And I said, well, if he wants me, he'll get in contact with me. And I and I kind of like said, here's my number. And then I said, whatever happens, happens. And they called me. He's like, well, will you come down and do an uh, you know, audition? I said, I don't have time, man. I said, honestly, I'll send you. And I'm not trying to sound cocky. I just I, I was working full time for a different company. I didn't have enough leeway to drive down and hopefully get a little a little role. Um, it wasn't little, I should say. It was a big role. But I just now I, I think about if I did put in effort, you know, maybe something good could come of it, you know, full time or not, not full time. But if something came up, if something came my way that uh, was worth, you know, going down and doing an audition for, and I, I definitely would nowadays, you know, rather than just say no, like I did last time. Yeah. And you, know, what's interesting is you have a lot of connections, you know, a lot of people in the business, I was going to bring up Josh here in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but before I do that, because again, I want to stay on track, so I don't forget shit. I think you'd be great for a film and especially Thank for you. horror films. You I you have the background. Um, now, what about Trick or Treat? Uh, again, you're very well connected in the Southern California horror community and beyond. Um, so what about, how did you land, you know, that relationship? How did that relationship with Trick or Treat Studios begin? Uh, began? Because holy fuck, when I was working, I, I did a stint at Spirit as a bucket list item for my life. I wanted to work for Spirit. Yeah, um, I've been there. 
everyone knows. And so I was there for, I, I told him when I came in, I'm like, you realize you don't have to pay me in money. I'll, I'll take merchandise. Uh, but I, I would love to tell anyone at Trick or Treat Studios the story yeah. of what I had to do to get that 2018 Michael Myers mask that I can't put on my big ass head. But that's not the point. It's because I want it because it was fucking it was it was the highlighted item of 2018. It was hard to get, but I have a whole spiel about it. But right. it's not my show. It's my show. But I want to hear about you. How did that relationship form? <laughs> Uh, well, I would always go um, as a fan to, you know, the conventions, Monster Palooza, Santa Monster Palooza, and I'd always make it an effort to go and check out the studio's booth. I mean, I, they have the most amazing masks, in my opinion, for the price. And I slowly but surely uh, became really cool with Justin Mabry. Um, I was a fan of Night Owl Studios before he even worked for, you know, Trick Two Studios, because I'm a Michael Myers guy. I, I try to you know, read up on all the masks and latest stuff. And I remember seeing Justin Mabry's amazing work, you know, when I was like, probably like 27, I remember seeing his Night Owl Studios uh, across the boards, you know, for fan boards. And so I knew who he was and me and him kind of formed a friendship and we became cool over the years and we just hit it off and became friends. And then I remember being at Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights uh, and I was wearing I was wearing um, a Halloween three shirt and then I saw this guy who was wearing a honky tonk man shirt and I, I we were standing in line and he goes, Hey, that's a really cool shirt. I said, so is yours, man. I'm a former pro wrestler. He goes, Oh shit, no way. I'm a huge fan. And me and him just started bullshitting. He goes, here's my business card. If you ever, you know, want to get in contact with me, email me. And it was Chris Zephro from British Studios. So I told him right then and there, I said, Hey dude, I'm a huge fan. I showed him my mask collection that I had, you know, from the times I purchased. Um, I remember seeing him once it came to me that who he was, uh, I remember seeing him at the you know shows, but he is rarely at the booths. You know, he's doing other things, you know, business wise and mingling and stuff. But um, yeah, man, me and him hit it off, and we became cool. And I emailed him. I said it was really nice meeting you, and I would love to, you know, if there ever was an opportunity to to have you know a position open up. I'm a great salesman because at the time, most of my life uh, when it comes to my income is revolved around sales. Because like yeah. I said, I never paid the bills. That was just more you know something that I was striving to do. Um, and if I ever got, you know, signed, so be it. But I had to have some sort of bread and butter on my, you know, on my table. So basically I was a salesman for a company for like almost six, seven years. I was working for this company and I was kind of just getting burnt out. It was commission based only and the hours sucked and I was just getting miserable. And I kept telling my wife, I said, Hey, I, you know, there's gotta be something better. Um, so, you know, me and Chris over the years became really cool at the conventions. We would always hang out and go to lunch and just start talking. And I said, Hey, I'd love to start promoting you guys more. And he goes, well, here, here's a little opportunity. If you want to run social media for us. So I said, sure. Um, so I did. So he hired me part time to do social media. I ran the Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that. And, um, you know, my, my skills as a social media manager were good when it comes to like dealing with customers. Um, but I didn't know the knowledge on how to do like crazy graphics and imaging and stuff like that. Cause I'm not a graphics artist designer, but, um, so I said, Hey, you know, this is fun. I did it for about six months. I said, but I really want to do sales. So if there's ever an opportunity, Chris, and he goes, well, I think we can make that happen. So he gave me the opportunity, uh, to become a full-time sales rep in the company. And, and I've been with the company now almost three years and it's been amazing. Uh, I wake up every morning blessed and I think. I thank my, I thank Chris and I thank Justin, you know, as many times as they've already heard me tell them, you know, I really appreciate the company and the opportunities they've given me, you know, so it's, it's definitely great, you know, from Trent, like I said earlier, it's, it went from one dream of being a pro wrestler, even though I didn't make a lot of money, but doing something I loved, you know, accomplishing a little bit of dreams uh, in the wrestling industry and then going as a full-time, uh, you know, employee for a company that has nothing to do except produce the best masks and costumes and props around, so. Costumes, props, awesome. home decor, yeah, fucking clothes, pins, air yeah. fresheners, pins. Um, right. you're in it. Figures, you action are, figures. Yes, you are, dude. The fucking Judith Myers tombstone will uh, be mine at some point during this Halloween season. Did you already the order point that? Is, yeah, I want to fucking order that. Uh, we'll yeah, it'll be, that it'll be it'll be Yeah, my buddy Darren <laughs> Roberts sculpted. My buddy Darren Roberts sculpted the Judith Myers tombstone, and it's absolutely oh, it's phenomenal. Um, fucking bad. You know, one not... customer so far has received it. And it looks pretty bitchin'. I know exactly who we're talking about too, because I got the promo or the the preview of the picture this morning. Bad fucking ass. Not the the. 
again, I will never knock Spirit, maybe once in a yeah. while, but remember they were only selling the one that's this big for years, years right. and years. And that was cool. Years. I almost bought one myself, but I mean, if I'm going to have one, I want a life-size, you know, replica. I want the life-size. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that, but I, I bought I one as well. To... I'm waiting for it to ship out to me. So. Fuck yeah. I have to say though, your skills are excellent because again, as you heard in the intro, my husband was on this Krampus mask for years or since, you know, you guys came out with it, which was, maybe I'm exaggerating, but he wanted this Krampus mask. And I'm like, dude, get the fucking mask. We're here. Right. We have the money for it. You were the one that sat there and talked to him and answered his questions while I was sifting through, you know, the, the horror yeah. of air fresheners. And he bought the mask. And then he bought the whole um, robe. And the next, robe that goes um, with it, yeah. Yeah, you guys are the Trick or Treat Studios, the only one that has the what we wanted, you know, when we first saw the film. Trick or Treat Studios does everything to the T. You guys, I don't have to advertise it. You guys all know who Trick or Treat Studios is. And here you go. <laughs> what Thanks. is your, I your appreciate that. Yeah, it's a great that company. Is, and, uh, people that, you know, want quality for, for the money. I mean, you can't, I mean, if you're portal. talking 20, 20 years ago, if you try to get an accurate, you know, screen looking mask you know from any company it would cost you you know 150 bucks 200 bucks but we produce great masks that you know are straight from the the imagery of the movie you're seeing we we try to get as most detail as possible so that you know fans collectors and you know people that want to dress up for halloween can look identical to the character that they're trying to be so that's what we take pride on yeah it takes see there's pride in it and the fact that you love the company before you went in to start working for right. them is what we all strive for. So, Bo, you are living the dream. I'm trying. Um, you are, you know, just what is the, the witchy way is live in the present, which is something I struggle with too, because I'm like, well, I could be doing more. What right. else do I need to do? But like live in that moment. Um, now, you know, with Trick or Treat Studios, it certainly has afforded you a million, many opportunities to meet celebs, you know, people that you grew up watching that you currently watch. Um, I don't think you've ever had an issue because your personality is magnetic. Um, you're friends with some of Southern California's biggest influencers like Ryan Turek, fucking um, the local boogeyman dude, Josh Hasty. You're found in Burbank setting up for Slashback video before COVID, you know, fucked that up. Um, right. I saw you chatting with Dell of Dark Delicacies, who I love spending time with. Um, it's been a long time. You've hung out with even us for a few bit for a little bit at the star set at rated our speakeasy. I was super drunk and was bouncing around the place because I was Me having too. so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good time. And then, yeah, so many more. So, you know, what was the first horror convention that you remember going to? And, you know, even with Trick or Treat Studios, how did you kind of just, you know, meet so many of these, you know, celebrities and influencers? Fucking Ryan um, Turk. Well, I, I if anyone knows, all the time. I'm a pretty, you know, big <laughs> social butterfly. I like to, you know, talk to people and get to know people. Uh, the first horror uh, convention I ever went to was Monster Palooza. I want to say it was 2000. Ship Carly would know. I want to say it's 2011, maybe. So the first one we did, it was at the Burbank Marriott, and we went down there, and I was just like, oh, this is fucking awesome. You know, I mean, this is something that any horror fan would you know dream about going to and that was my real first convention um that that night i actually well the second day uh we stayed at the hotel even though we lived close i you know we made a weekend out of it and we still do we always like to just get away for the weekend and go to burbank and see people and friends and you know experience the whole atmosphere of the the, the three days but um the first second night i actually met a friend down there uh who i've known because in the bouncing industry i did security for a long time and he was going so we went to the Bailey Barn Grill and had a couple of drinks after the show. And then his uh, his name's Ryan, but his uh, wife's sister at the time was with uh, Mike Hill. And they were all sitting at the table and me and Mike Hill hit it off right away. I mean, he was just funny and drinking with me and he was a great, funny guy. And I, and I didn't even, to be honest with you, know who he was until, you know, afterwards. I, I The next day I saw him and at, his, at his booth and he told me, you know, what he did for a living. He was, you know, a sculptor. And I said, well, that's amazing. And then I saw the phenomenal work that he did and it was just unbelievable. I mean, he's in my opinion, one of the best sculptors in the world. Um, but yeah, he, he, he became close with me and me and him became really good friends. So we'd always look forward to, you know, Monster Palooza, you know, once, once uh, we got there with Ryan, uh, with uh, Mike and it was awesome, you know, to, to, to become friends with someone who, before I even knew who he was, you know, he's so looked up upon with the horror community and the, and the I mean, he's amazing. I mean, he's a sculptor. He's done, you know, the movie Shape of Water. 
Um, you know, he's worked with Guillermo del Toro. I mean, but his images alone, uh, when you're standing in front of it at, at, at Monster Blues or any convention, and you see his work in front of you is mind mind blowing. So yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so, so then I, you know, um, I became friends with with Mike, and then throughout the years, I just I slowly but surely just started meeting people, and I, I consider them friends, and they consider me friends. So then it just grew. I mean, it's guys like Doug Tate. He's an amazing actor, and me and him always when we see each other, you know, say what's up, give each other a big high five and a hug. And guys like Justin Mabry, who I mentioned before, and it just, you know, you network, you network with people that, you know, you look up, look up to. I mean, but it's cool to see these people as, as, you know, not just an idol or someone that, you know, horror fans look up to, but if you get to know them as a, you know, personal people, they're, they're great. You know, they're great people. Most, most people I've ever met in the horror industry and in the community mm -hmm. are, amazing, you know, I mean, I've yet to meet anyone that's kind of, you know, dickish. I mean, there can be a couple people, but, most of the time, uh, anyone in the horror industry is pretty awesome. I agree. Um, I remember effects industry, I should say as well. Right. I I remember. I, I think that's what it is about the horror industry too. Is I was intimidated even by you. I was like, he's not gonna. He was like, what do I have to offer? Everyone that I've always looked up to or had, you know, an interest in it, influenced everything that I do today has been so receptive. From Ryan Turek to you to Mr. Death Breath, to, you know, everyone that I've attempted to speak with, I haven't been shut down except by one person. And I wouldn't say that he shut me down. <laughs> he yeah. just wasn't impressed by Michelle Halloween's boobs is all it was. Did you name drop him or no? Oh, they drop his ass because um, I have a show coming up, you'll see, <laughs> that is in honor of him because despite the fact that he wasn't impressed with my boobs, sometimes they're too much, I still love the guy. It was Ken Fourier. <laughs> Who is it? Ken Fourier. Oh, Ken Fourier. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> he was not interested in my. I, I was at Monster Palooza 2018, uh, Friday night, and I was drunk as usual. Um, that's how I have fun. You know what I mean? Like, I get to these places. I'm like, first of all, there's booze, there's whore. I have to do it. Everyone, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if if you know me, everyone knows I'm I'm a I'm the big party when it comes to Monster Palooza. I mean, I have <laughs> we're hanging out in the hotel room. You know, we're, we're drinking some beers. We're getting you know wild and having a good time. Obviously oh, yeah. now that I work, you know, obviously now that I'm, you know, working the booths, you know, at trick or treat, I gotta make sure I stay sober during, you know, the business transaction time period. But once the once the convention, you know, uh, closes down, you know, I'm gonna be at the bar having a couple cold ones. With right, it's, it's so fun. much fun. The horror yeah. community is just the fucking best, and I love what you're doing because you're inspiring me to just keep going out there and keep talking. So yeah, you know, I love that. The more, networking, the more networking you do, the better opportunities you can make, and. Hopefully, you know, you can get this show you can have a million views at one point, you know? One day. <laughs> Maybe. Now, every awesome dude out there is not fortunate enough to have a queen, you know, this queen of darkness alongside him. Um, you know, I think what gets me is Carly's smile. Um, tell us, how did you and Carly come to be, you know, this fucking union that you two have? You guys are hot as fuck. And I feel like you guys have been together for a really long fucking time. Um, yeah. As you know, an iconic horror couple in the Southern California horror community. How oh. did you two meet? When did you meet? And give us some, you know, marital advice. <laughs> marital advice, shit. Oh, man. <laughs> Don't kill Let each other. You know? No. Um, <laughs> me and Carly met in 2001. I was 21 years old and then she was 18. Uh, we met through a mutual friend um, out in Santa Clarita. I, I went and visited uh, my buddy. And uh, he said, hey, man, let's go hang out with some chicks. I said, sure, you know, I'm single. And he was single. And he knew these two girls. And, and we ended up going to their house and picking them up. And we went, I think we went to, like, this place called the Nike Base. It was just, like, this way up in the hills, like, old, like, base where they would, like, do, I don't know. It was just, like, a kind of like a lover's lane, I guess you would say. But it was mm. one of the reasons why. Yeah, but we weren't, I mean, I was hoping, but I didn't even know. So we just drove up there and drank some beers and hung out. And I got to meet her. And. At the time, she kind of had a boyfriend, so I was like, I don't want to be a dick and try to disrespect, you know, her or him. So we became cool. Um, and then I think at the end of the night, you know, she gave me a little kiss on the cheek. I said, "Cool, nice meeting you." And then, like a couple weeks later, uh, I went back out to visit my friend, and he said, "Hey, you know, you want to hang out with uh, Carly and her friend again?" I said, "Sure." And then I we picked them back up, and we went. We went. Uh, I think we went golf and stuff or something. But I said, "Hey, you know, you have a boyfriend." She goes, "No, he's not really my boyfriend." So then I knew. She's like, I'm just dating. I said, like, okay, cool. So then me and her hit it off. Uh, we had a good time together. And then she got into like an argument with her roommate that she was staying with. And she's like, hey, is it cool if I come and stay at your place? Because at the time, I wasn't living in Simi. I was living in Palmville, 
Uh, my mom bought a house up there, and I, I was staying with her for a while. And then we, we, you know, she came and spent the weekend with me. And I said, hey, you know, I really dig you. You know, if you're not with this guy too seriously, I'd like to, you know, spend more time with you or whatever. And she said, yeah. And so she'd come. So every weekend, like, I would go up to there and pick her up. And she'd come back down and stay with me in Palmdale. Um, and then, you know, it just got more and more better each day. And we fell in love. And then I basically said, hey, why don't, you, why don't we get our own place? So we got a little uh, mobile home together. We bought a little, uh, well, we didn't buy it. We rented it, actually. Um, so we lived on, that was like 2000. Two, so a year we were together. We got our own little place out in Santa Clarita because she's from Santa Clarita. That's like where I met her. And we started living together, and things have been good. And then, you know, obviously everyone has their ups and downs. We've, you know, gone through a lot of bullshit together. I mean, when you grow up with someone so young, I was 21, she was 18, you know, you, you work out the kinks in a relationship, you know, and she's had a little bit of a rough past. I had a little bit of a rough past, but we try to forget the forget the past and make everything, you know, move forward and work, work together as a team. Um, so then I started doing, you know, security on the sides and then uh, things, you know, she, she, there were certain things about me and her that were amazing and there's certain things that didn't click and we never left each other's side, but, you know, we started realizing, hey, if we're going to make this work, we got to be more mature because there was, you know, certain things like lies and there was a little bit of drug use there that I wasn't a fond of that, you know, she was still doing behind my back at one point. And I said, hey, I'm not down for this. If you're going to fucking be with me, you know, you need to grow up because I'm trying to make a future. And she goes, yeah, I agree. So then she, you know, she stopped doing the, the bullshit. And, you know, I was trying to be more of an adult and try to, you know, save money because I, I knew I wanted to eventually move out of Santa Clarita and buy a house somewhere. And so then like 2000, I want to say 2008, uh, we were been, we've obviously been together almost eight years at that point. Uh, we had a little falling out. Uh, she left and we split for about six months and we both realized that, hey, after being with someone for so long, even though you guys have a little bit of problems, you know, in a relationship, we're the ones that we wanted to be with each other. So like you, you kind of had to separate for the first time just to see uh, that we both missed each other. So then she came back and we said, hey, let's make this work. Let's get married. And she said, OK, I, you're the only one I want to be with. Um, and I said, same. So then 2009, we got married and the rest is history. <laughs> oh, I, you guys, fuck. And see, I love hearing that because most of the stories that you hear, everyone's like, oh, marriage is so good. No, I mean, marriage it's is hard. hard. And, and she'll, she'll admit that, you know, but you know what? We've been together so long now. Um, the only thing we basically bitch and fight about is laundry. Uh, you know, and you know, obviously stress, you know, from, you know, we're, we both work super hard and we both have long hours, you know, uh, with work. Um, COVID definitely has taken a toll on the stress level because we're around each other more often than not. And some people say, well, wouldn't you want to be around your spouse constantly 24 seven? No, dude, you got to have go up at nights with, you got to go out and have beers with your boys and she needs to go out and go get her hair done with her friends and go have fun. But that's kind of difficult to do at this point. So, you know, us being home together, <laughs> definitely we pick and fight a little bit here and there, but nothing serious. I mean, we always go to bed at the end of the, the one, the one marital advice I could say is like, always go to bed, never go to bed mad. Cause you never know, you know. Yeah. Never go to bed angry at each other. Cause you never know if you're even going to wake up the next day. So at least try to respect each other and say, Hey, you know, I'm sorry for whatever we did earlier in the day. If we got into an argument or whatever, let's try to just say, move on and make it a new day. Things. Yeah, I love each other. Yeah. Oh God, that's perfect. Mushy, mushy I, that romance was, bullshit. Yeah, that's perfect. It's not even mushy romance. It's just the fact that don't sugarcoat that relationships are right. tough. You're talking about two different people from two different backgrounds making yep. a life together. So anyone who says, "Oh, we've been together our whole lives. We're fine. We're perfect." Oh, don't give me that line of bullshit. No. So I mean, I especially, especially when two outcasts come together. I love right. the horror community. I love horror couples. So I always have to ask. So I appreciate yeah. that. And I love her smile. And I love when you guys are together and you take the cute pictures. Thank you. Well, pictures. We, definitely have, we definitely have good times. You know, she's my rock. She's my support. If, if I didn't have her, uh, I probably would definitely not have been successful with a lot of things in my life. And I think she feels the same way. You know, I took her away from a bad uh, habit that she had at one point and she has helped me grow as a, as a man and, and, you know, got my ducks in order and, and we built a, we built a kingdom together. I call her my uh, good witch queen, you know, she yeah. 
<laughs> that's our that's our mushy little names for each other. Polar Bear and Good Witch Queen. Yeah. I love it. And she uses Good Witch as for as for her Instagram handle. I love She's it. She's a big Wizard of Oz fan, so she uses that all the time. Yeah. Makes sense. It makes sense. So you know, with COVID putting a stop to so much, um, you know, let's just do it. But even before COVID, you have this plan in place with, uh, I think you had it in place, um, besides the fact that you're now full-time with Trick or Treat Studios waiting for COVID to fuck off. Um, but you're in the process of still developing and putting out Hops and Horror, which we need more than ever during the Halloween season. Again, craft brews, celebrity shout outs, um, horror, reviews of horror movies, all the yeses to anything that I wanted to do during COVID <laughs> is everything that Hops and Horror is. So, you know, give us some more insight on how that came to be and what your hopes is for Hops and Horror. Uh, yeah, Hops and Horror on Instagram. Um, if you can find us, uh, you know, at Hops and Horror. Uh, we, it's basically myself and my buddy Robert Novelli. Uh, Rob is one of the, my only friends that has almost as cool as collection as I do. No, we always, we always fuck with each other because he has an amazing horror collection and so do I, but we always go to each other's houses and it's almost like I want some shit he has and he wants some shit I have. But uh, me and him became friends about three years ago. We met at a, a, a brewery and he was where it was kind of like how me and Chris would met. He was wearing a horror shirt and I was wearing a horror shirt and we started just bullshitting and talking and we became really cool and close. And he lives right down the street from me and him and his wife uh, and my, my, me and my wife, we go out, you know, for dinner and drinks, you know, stuff like that. And we just became really cool. And I said to him, I said, hey, man, you know, we got nothing but time on our hands. We should do something cool and fun and talk horror movie reviews. And he's like, yeah, let's do something. So I said, well, let's put two and two together. You're a big, huge beer craft guy, and so am I. I mean, he has an extensive amount of beer in his fridge, I mean, that are just untouched that he saves for a special occasion. But I always try to drink them, but those are like the <laughs> stouts and all the, the bourbon barrel aged stouts and the fancy beers. But uh, I said, why don't we call ourselves Hops and Horror? And he goes, yeah, that's awesome. I said, okay, so let's just do it. And so I picked the one movie, which was the first film, Children of the Corn, and we sat down and we did it. And we didn't even think to have like cool ambience at the first video. I think we've won. I think we've done like 12 videos now. I mean, I have to count, but uh, I said, well, we got to get more ambience. We got to start doing funny skits. You know, let's do some funny shit, you know, make people really want to enjoy watching it rather than just two fat dudes drinking a beer talking about horror movies. You know, let's do fun stuff. So we've, 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 you know, try to grow as much as possible in the, in the short time that we've done this. We've only been doing it for about four months now, but it's fun. We enjoy it. Uh, every Wednesday we upload a new video and we've, we've done some fun, amazing videos so far. And thanks to all the amazing horror uh, celebrities that have given us the time to, say you know follow hops and horror and give us a cool shout outs you know it means a lot to me and rob and uh we're just doing it for fun and i think that you know fans out there if you're into craft beers and you like watching horror movies give us a follow and check out our videos i, I mean i don't think you'd be disappointed oh fuck no and then you bring that up you're like well follow is not that big just keep in mind four months it took me when i started putting myself out there it took me about that time to reach you know a thousand followers myself so yeah. and again it's all about the fun i think the more fun you have with it the more the follow you'll get um Absolutely. you've had shout outs from dv calabrese from felissa rose um i have an idea for you if you're interested um i'll talk to you about that afterwards but folks just keep in mind that we me and Bo and Robbie might be doing something during the Halloween season together, maybe, but go. I am putting pressure on you. I'm no, no, I'm down. <laughs> I mean, like I said, this is just for fun. Uh, we, you know, we've got a couple, we got a couple merchandise little things here and there. We got, we had some koozies that we've sold. We've, you know, we've given out a lot of koozies. I got some stickers on the way. Uh, I actually have stickers. Uh, I got some pins on the way. Uh, we're going to do some t-shirts. Um, yeah, there's another Hops and Horror that's in Virginia, but they only have like 40 followers. And I think it's an inactive account, but I'm, I'm going to, literally probably within the next two weeks get that uh name copyrighted because i mean yeah. i definitely want it to be you know even though it's for fun i think it definitely could progress and be something you know that could make us a little bit of cash on the side and we're not obviously doing it for a profit but it would be nice if we could you know sell merchandise and stuff like that and you know get some gas money and beer money and then uh we definitely will we want to do uh as much as we can to show the horror fans that we're legit uh having fun with this and we want to continue it so yeah we're gonna try to get it copyrighted so that no other son of a bitch can steal the name yeah motherfuckers, Fuck oh, fuckers. don't make me fucking pile drive those motherfuckers 
<laughs> and he will. Bo, you're the one that I want, at me, I want with me at metal shows. I just want to hang out with you more. <laughs> Fucking COVID. I only got one opportunity, but we're in the virtual realm. So anytime yeah, is good. Absolutely. Where do you live again? I live in Rancho Cucamonga. Like, I know, 951, right? No, it's 909. 909, yeah. I'm not proud to live here. I'm just saying. Um, It's just, what the fuck? We're, what are we going to do? Yeah, <laughs> but Rancho's I can it's better it's than downtown time. San Bernardino. No, yeah. Ew. No, we wouldn't live there. <laughs> All right, no, I'm saying Rancho's <laughs> way nicer. It's nice. It's just a pain in the ass to live here. But we are only 40 miles from L.A., so, you know, it has its conveniences. Absolutely. Um, from everywhere that we want to be. All right, guys. Thank you so much, Bo, for coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. I had a great hour talking with you. I can't wait to drink more with you. I can't wait to watch more horror movies with you. You see it on the screen, how to find Bo Cooper. Dude, thanks again. I don't know what else to say. Would you want to give any shout outs? No, I appreciate you, you know, for taking the time to have me. Uh, it's definitely been a fun Sunday afternoon. I definitely got to get something to eat so I can start drinking. Oh, catch yeah. up with you, you know? <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, no, make sure you guys follow uh, Michelle Halloween and make sure you guys support Hobson and Horror and uh, make sure you guys support Trick or Treat Studios. And, um, you know, I hope to see every one of you guys in person soon and, Hopefully we can be cheersing, you know, in the, in the real world and not just over the internet world. And uh, Halloween season is upon us, guys. So make sure you start making sure the, even though there's shit going on down in the world that probably will change our, our uh, Halloween events, don't let it change your, you know, Halloween uh, in your heart and your mindset. Because, you know, last night me and Carly, we went and drove about 40 minutes away just to go get some Yankee Candle Halloween releases. And, and we lit, you know, the candles and we started decorating the inside of our house a little bit. So make sure everyone just stays in the Halloween spirit because that's what we live for and stay and safe. Good. Exactly. Yeah. You guys can do this. And you Absolutely. heard it from Bo. Yep. <laughs> Until next heard time, everyone. Bo. Thanks, guys. Shut the fuck up.